So it's Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by Eddie Hearn. And Eddie, we've got some breaking news, I believe, that uh, Katie Taylor, rematch long awaited with Amanda Serrano, has now been confirmed. Just yes. tell us about that and yes. why it is where it is. It's been um, negotiations for probably a couple of weeks, really. Had a, received an offer from Nikisa and Jake Paul, most valuable promotions. It was a great offer. Um, we had conversations with DAZN and Brian Peters and everybody. And you know, I want to thank DAZN as well for allowing her to take this this one fight, and uh, it's a big fight, great opportunity for her. I think she'll comfortably make it 2-0, and uh, pleased to get it made. And why have you decided to kind of take a step back from it? Is it just such a great opportunity for Katie? Yeah, I think, you know, from the promotional point of view, obviously it's one thing, you know, to zone and uh, giving us the blessing to do it, but at the same time I won't be involved promotionally in the show because I've got our own platform and our own jobs to do. But I think it's very important for fighters to be able to take the right opportunities and life-changing opportunities. And, you know, I was so pleased with the zone for actually acknowledging that. It's, it's, it's quite often where politics will get in, in the way and opportunities are taken away from fighters. You know, we know that and we're confident that if she goes there, secures victory, comes back, you know, and we make a massive fight for her neck. So, um, it was a great opportunity for the career of Katie Taylor and, and collectively as a team decided it was the right one. Now we are here at the Marriott Hotel in Regent's Park to talk about the five versus five on June the 1st. Incredible action guaranteed. Not too many surprises. Obviously you ruined one of them by outing Nick Ball. No, 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 I mean, <laughs> you know, I actually think it was Dev. You yeah. know, if you actually watch it back, I said I'm a big fan. But you kind of, of looked over the well, I was just talking over there. You know, I said, and I'm a big fan of Nick Ball. And he said, well, he's wearing a mask. I said, who mentioned he's there? I don't know. Yeah, no, it was a bit of a balls up. But um, I think the whole concept has been so well received, honestly. Like, you know, you've got Bivol Better Beav as the main event. I mean, we're forgetting that as well. That's on top of the 5v5. You could have got away with lesser car- lesser undercard, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, look, if we were doing Bivol Better Beav, it's like when people criticise the Fury Usyk undercard. I mean, come on, like... Literally, we probably would struggle to even put on an undercard on a on a fight like that. So, it's massive. I mean, I think June first, actually, top to bottom, is probably the best card I've ever seen. And two weeks before, you've got Fury Usyk. It's amazing what's happening. So, yeah, really proud of of the show. Proud of how it's all played out, and just a massive night ahead. We'll go through the card in a minute. But first of all, how did you decide who your captain was going to be? Um, it was difficult because I think there's guys that are bigger favourites in their fights. I mean. Deontay Wilder, I saw the betting odds this morning, is actually quite a, not a big outsider, but he's an outsider against Zhang. I just want to ignite that belief and that fire inside him. Obviously, from a profile perspective, from an age perspective, from an achievements perspective, he's he is the senior guy on the team. But I just want, you know, and I got into him a little bit yesterday. I feel sometimes that although it's, a lot of people don't like me, they probably underestimate how I can make them feel. Mm. And, and in terms of being feeling like a star, feeling wanted, feeling, you know, and Deontay's never really had that because he's never really had a promoter. You know, Shelley Fink, who's been the manager, done a great job, but no he's one out there beating, beating the, the drum saying, this is the man, you know? He's had to do that. And now I'm out there saying, this is guy, he can bounce back here. He's dangerous. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I was bigging him up on that thing we were joking around with yesterday and he was like, Bomb squad, and I could feel his energy, and that's why I wanted to give him the captaincy as well to say, "Look, you're the, you're the man," you know. And um, hopefully, I'm right. What gives you the faith? I mean, obviously, they're both coming off defeat to the same man in Joseph Parker, but Wilder has been inactive for a long time before that fight. Hasn't looked great on that return. What gives you the confidence he can turn things around? Because I think he's got a lot left in the tank. It's, it's a mindset thing, you know. I don't think he's ever been blessed with the you know amazing fundamentals in a sport like I don't think technically he's as good as Fury and Usyk but he's got power in his hands that can put anybody to sleep but he's got to have the confidence to throw and you know against Parker don't forget he was inactive for a huge amount of time and that that 10 rounds or was it 10 or 12 I think it was 10 will, will really help him to I know he got beat but Against Zhang, it's a little bit, I know he's a southpaw, but just a little bit more of a static guy yeah. who has slower feet, who will be there, particularly for the straight right hand down the middle. And I know that if Wilder lands on Zhang, it's over. It's quite interesting, you know, in the, the pit we did earlier, Joseph Parker said that Zhang is the bigger puncher. But Wilder never really landed, did he? I mean, you know, so 
but Joseph was great in in that fight, and um, it is a you know it's a fifty fifty fight. Two huge punches. And what's the deal with Matchroom and Deontay? Is it just a one off? Yeah, yeah, just purely. I mean, it was hard enough getting that one over the line. You know, it's a very strange situation where, you know, His Excellency said because I I have obviously I have AJ, I have Hergovic, I've got Huni. I just felt that Huni was just a little bit early for him, so I said to His Excellency like can I go and sign another fighter? He said, mm, only in this one division. And he was the first guy that I thought of in terms of who was available. But obviously it was like, he can't stand you, you know. And we kind of made up before the Parker fight, but then I think after the Parker fight, I probably said a few things that aggravated him as well. And it was just, you know, reaching out to Shelley and, and Deontay and just saying, guys, like, forget the history. This is a big opportunity. And I take this event seriously. Like, if you're on the team, I really want to make, I, I don't want, to work with anybody on in this format where I'm not screaming and shouting and jumping through the ropes for them. So we had a great chat with His Excellency and Deontay yesterday, just trying to say, let's get it back, you know, and, and that's why I made him captain as well, just to give him that extra belief going into this and make him feel like part of the team as well. Because I know the other guys, they're all in it for, for themselves and the company. And that means a lot. Who would you have the most faith in? Because as you said, Wilder's not the biggest favourite, yeah. so you didn't pick the captain for that reason. But who have you got the most faith in? Who is the biggest favourite in your eyes I think for Matrix? Philip Hergovic. You know, I really fancy him against Daniel Dubois. I, I think Ray Ford wins wins well, but I really rate Nick Ball and I think he's a right handful. I think Craig Richards is a favourite over Willie Hutchinson. I think he's looking fantastic in the gym. But Willie's a game kid, you know. Like, this is a massive stage for those guys. And that's one of the pleasing things about this whole concept. And when they went to Bulgaria and this Hollywood film set and you've got like Ammo Williams, Craig Richards, Ray Ford, they're like, it's, they're so nice for, the, for them to experience it, you know. What's the closest to a 50-50 in your view? I mean, I think there are fights where we are slight underdog. Possibly Ammo. You know, Hamza. I mean, I'm not so sure about Hamza Shiraz in the, the point of the wins over Liam Williams, and who was the win before that? I can't remember where he stopped someone in two rounds. I think it was the international opponent, was it? But, like, with all due respect, Liam Williams is done, right? Ammo Williams is fresh. He's 16 and 0. He's full of energy. I mean, he's walking around here with a tiger's tail. If that don't make you wonder, I'm not sure what will. So, that's a brilliant fight. But I understand why the bookies might make Hamza the, the slight favourite in that fight. So, you know, but they've made Zhang the favourite in a Wilder fight. I don't see that, actually. But I guess if you're looking at last performances, maybe. Now, two weeks before the five versus five, you obviously got Fury versus Usyk. We'll ask for a prediction. I mean, you've done it before, but you might have changed your mind. But what do you expect to happen with the IBF title? Will it become vacant as soon as the bell rings? Or? Yeah, no, I think after the fight, what will happen is that it's already been ordered that the winner of that fight has to fight Hergovic next. Okay? No exceptions, because there was an exception last time. So after the fight, there'll be a letter for negotiations. Now, we all know, let's not waste each other's time. Hergovic is not fighting the winner of that fight. So the IBF fight should become vacant. And there's a very good chance it could be on the line for Dubois against Hergovic, which would be great for the tournament. But AJ is also after Hergovic, so he would have to kind of give it the blessing. Maybe he looks to fight the winner. Maybe I, I've no idea what's going to happen. But I do think the IBF championship will become vacant at some point. Talking of AJ, what's it looking likely for him now that he takes a fight before a Fury Usyk winner? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, everyone keeps talking about this two-fight deal. And it, yes, it is contracted. And I'm sure that's absolute... Watertight. Like, <laughs> yeah, but also not just watertight, but very likely to happen. Now, someone could break their arm. Someone could get, I don't know, anything. Not wishing that on a mic. Absolutely not. <laughs> but, you know, anything's possible in boxing. And you know that His Excellency is going to be very tempted to make what would be the biggest fight in the history of the sport. But I do expect the two fights. Maybe AJ fights in the meantime for the world title and then fights the winner. But let's see what happens on May the 18th. What's given you that kind of renewed confidence in AJ? I've heard you say this version of AJ smashes Tyson Fury, could beat Usyk in a third fight. Just, it's all mental with AJ. When he believes in what he's doing... I think he's unbeatable and he really believes in what he's doing. I'm watching him punch on the pads. I'm watching him in training. Can't tell you the difference between when, so watching him warm up for the Usyk fights and even, you know, the Franklin fight and the Hergovic fight, uh, the uh, Hellenius fight, different beast. And I know, you know, it's all irrelevant, me saying I know he can knock Fury out because, you know, Fury's a great fight and, you know, Fury's got a win first on... Um, on May the 18th, but AJ right now, I back him to beat anybody. 
Do you fancy Fury to get the job done on the 18th? I keep going backwards and forwards. I saw um, some video of Usyk training the other day. She looked good, like looked very well conditioned. I was leaning towards Fury, now I'm leaning towards Usyk, but I do genuinely you know Spencer Brown didn't believe me when I said it to him the other day. I really hope Fury wins, and then, not just because he's a Brit, but because we want to set up that fight. I just want to ask about Conor Ben. Obviously, the dust has settled now from the um, appeal from the board and UCAD. What's the next steps well, it hasn't for? Really, I mean, yeah, nothing. There's been no comment from anybody. Um, so, you know, until there is, obviously, no one knows what's happening moving forward. There's a lot of conversations going on at the moment, and I'm sure at some point there'll be some news. But frustrating to keep on waiting. But I think where are we now? We're coming up to June, which is two years since since the test. It's remarkable it's gone on this long, but it has and we are where we are. Um, but I think there'll be some news soon and then we can hopefully get on with it. What specifically or who specifically are you waiting for? Is it the board's come out with a statement or a ruling? The whole, the whole thing is under a confidentiality um, and among all the parties, not me, but among the board, UCAD and Connor. And they're, you know, they're, they're discussing at the moment. Obviously, they've got the hearing, the decision and... Um, you know, when they when they have agreed a way forward, I'm sure there'll be an announcement. How, if at all, has your view of the boxing board changed over this whole process over the last two years? I think it's a very difficult job that any governing body have to, to rule a sport. We are the governing body, not in boxing, but in darts and in snooker and in other sports as well. And it's very difficult to make the right decisions all the time. The, being honest, the one thing that I haven't um, liked during the process is the um, lack of interest, desire, whatever it is, for the board to engage in any communication or conversation about the situation. And I feel like it's been a mess and it could have been handled in a different way from us, or for Connor, and from the board as well. But every time we've looked to engage in a sensible, common sense conversation, they've not been willing to do it. Um, the the way that it was handled initially, which I do understand it's difficult because you've got a lot of, you know, you've got legal implications, etc. But the fact that the board received those tests, didn't do anything about it for five or six weeks, and then three days before the fight, after everything had been spent on the fight, and people say, oh, you all you cared about is money. Yeah, because we never received anything back from the board after Chris Eubank Jr.'s doctors looked at the results and said, we're happy, after you know everybody else was happy, and I'm not saying it should have gone ahead, but the board asked for all this, and contractually, we have to wait for a decision from the board. So, in an ideal world, you know, in hindsight, should we have dealt with it differently? In some respects, yes. But the fact that they had that information on the test and for five weeks didn't act, until three days before and effectively leaked it to the media. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of um, things that have played out that I'm not happy with. But I also acknowledge it's been difficult for them and it's not a normal situation. But I think in this, in that situation, it's always best to sit down and have a, you know, without prejudice or off the record conversation and say, guys, I think, let, what's the way forward here? And advise Connor on what he should do rather than just going out, speaking on TalkSport about the fighter and about the case. Eddie, really appreciate your time. Cheers.